Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm Rachel Anderson, the president of Best Friends, which is the support group for the Downtown LA Library's Business and Economics and Science, Technology, and Patents departments. Our purpose is both to raise funds for these key library departments and to create awareness of the valuable services that they provide to our community. Best Friends is very proud to be celebrating Octavia Lab's second publication, More Hidden Heroes, Historic Places, a coloring book for Los Angeles. <laughs> we are honored to be presenting you with this incredible publication, as well as to be joined by family members and other representatives of some of the heroes featured in the book. We are so grateful to them for being here today. We would also like to thank the Los Angeles Conservancy for joining us in supporting and promoting the book launch today. Finally, we would like to acknowledge that we are on the traditional and unceded territory who have been known as the Kitsch, Gabrileño, and Tongva throughout their several thousand year stewardship of this region. To introduce today's speakers, please welcome Viha of the Octavia Lab. Hello, welcome. Um, the Octavia Lab, a DIY makerspace that is free for Los Angeles Public Library card holders to use. We are a 3,000 square foot space that has Adobe Creative Cloud, you know, 3D printers, laser cutters, a whole slew of stuff that's available for library card users to use. Next slide, please. So this is our second coloring book launch, More Hidden Heroes, Historic Places, a coloring book for Los Angeles. We are gonna be profiling, next slide, please. Um, 15 local heroes and, we're, and local and historic places throughout Los Angeles. Next slide, please. And a little bit about our coloring page. This is JL, um, JL Edmonds. And with each of our coloring pages, there's a coloring page that you get along with a biography, a location description, and suggested activities that's been put together by the Los Angeles Conservancy. And here to talk about more about what the Conservancy does is Sana. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Sana Emeth, and I work with the Los Angeles Conservancy as the Student and Family Program Manager. And we are a historic preservation nonprofit based in downtown Los Angeles, right across from Pershing Square, although we are currently working from home. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about our organization and the wonderful opportunity that the Central Los Angeles Library, or the Octav Octavia Labs at the Central Los Angeles this library provided us to partner with them on this fabulous um, coloring book. So at the Los Angeles Conservancy, we work through education and advocacy to recognize, preserve, and revitalize historic and architectural and cultural places in all of Los Angeles County. So these include buildings, these include places, parks, all the different historic sites that are found in Los Angeles County, we seek to teach others about them and advocate for the preservation or the protection of them so they are not demolished, so that the histories and the people that are connected to those stories and buildings are preserved. And we have a variety of programs in how we do this. We have our student programs, which if you're interested, you can connect with me um, after today's event. We have walking tours, we have special events, all of these different ways that we are teaching people about historic places important to the Los Angeles County area. Stay in touch with us. You can email us at education at laconservancy.org. You can follow us on social media at LA Conservancy. And I wanted to tell you about a really special event that's happening next week celebrating the largest park in Los Angeles, Griffith Park, celebrating its 125th anniversary. And it's a free event. It's open to everyone in all ages. You can register on our website and you, we will send you a event booklet, which has different schedule activities throughout the day, a map where different um, individuals and guest speakers will be present. And so we hope to see you there, in addition to learning about the wonderful places that you will find in this year's coloring book. We were very excited to participate with the um, Los Angeles Library once again for this coloring book. We are a place-based organization and we encourage people to engage with historic places as they visit them to learn about them. And so the activities that are in this coloring book are meant to 
activate curiosity, to encourage people to look at these historic places differently, to have art to think about these historic places, have conversations when you're at these historic places. So we hope you enjoy this coloring book. We hope you take part in the activities and we hope you inspire others to learn about these historic places. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Okay, so first up, we have um, Charles Matthew, who's going to be speaking about Miriam Matthews. Thank you. Hello. Um, can you hear me all right? Yes, hello. Um, I'm Charles Matthews, nephew of Miriam Matthews. Thank you to the Octavia Lab and best friends of the Los Angeles Public Library for this wonderful coloring book and including the pages on my aunt and for inviting me to speak today. Uh, I was very close to my aunt for most of my life. I knew her more as the aunt who was always doing nice things for me and trying to guide me along the way. I come to better appreciate all the things that she accomplished. I think the information on her contained in this book is excellent in capturing her essence and the breadth of her activities, both before and after her retirement as uh, from the Los Angeles Public Library. The book also does a wonderful job in suggesting activities related to, to her and enlisting resources and places. She was an advocate for intellectual freedom and believed strongly in preserving the history of African-American life and accomplishments, particularly in Los Angeles. And she also felt it was important that this history be known and that resources be made available and accessible both to researchers and the general public. Having a Los Angeles Public Library branch named after her, the Hyde Park Mary Matthews branch was truly an honor. You should visit if you get the chance. This is one of the suggested activities in the book. Of her accomplishments, she was very proud of the establishment of a historic monument commemorating the 44 original founders of the city of Los Angeles in 1781 and their racial di diversity. She spearheaded this project for the 1981 bicentennial celebration of the city's founding. Here's the photo I took of my aunt standing next to the Los Angeles Los Pobladores Monument, located in El Centro de Los Angeles State Historic Park Plaza in downtown Los Angeles on the occasion of that celebration. If you uh, have never been down there, but you know Oliveira Street, you're right there, very close. This monument is very close by in the plaza. I also recommend viewing the park and monument if you have the opportunity. This is another suggested activity in the book. Once again, thank you to the Octavia Lab and best friends of the Los Angeles Public Library. And a special thanks to Kelly Wallace of the Los Angeles Public Library History Department, who reached out to me and suggested I speak today. This is a wonderful book and a real tribute both to the individuals and the places named in it. Thank you. Charles, thank you so much for that. We deeply appreciate you coming on to us and talking about Miriam Matthews. She's been an inspiration for us here at LAPL. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. So next up, we have a recording from Lori Ujijikian who's gonna be speaking about Gabriel Ujijikian.
Hello, everyone. My name is Lori Njajikian, and I am here representing my grandfather, Gabriel Njajikian. So oftentimes, a lot of change makers in our communities, they go unnoticed, right? And so I'm really grateful to the Friends of the Los Angeles Public Library for publishing More Hidden Heroes, Hidden Places to provide this platform and share these voices. All right, so like many of us from Los Angeles, or I mean in Los Angeles, Gabriel and Jijikin was not from Los Angeles. He was born in 1930 in Kesab, Syria, which is an ancient Armenian settlement that has been around since the Armenian Kingdom of Cilicia. And I have a map and I'll show that to you later. All right, so he was born in 1930 and he was the youngest of six children. But growing up, he really was aware of how important it is to preserve your cultural identity and how important family and education are because he inherited the legacy of his forebearers, which was this legacy of being constantly persecuted. So he was born in 1913, sorry, 1930, and the Armenian genocide was in 1915. So he was born 15 years after this genocide and of course, naturally, like this was a very big part of his life, preserving your Armenian identity. His father was, of course, an important political figure in Kesab, and not only an important political figure, but the only doctor in the greater Kesab region. And so he understood that one of the reasons that his family survived was because of education. And so education becomes a very important thing for him early on. All right, so he then goes to Beirut, Lebanon to pursue an associate's degree because this was not available to him in Kesab. So he goes to Lebanon and he attains an associate's degree from the American University of Beirut. After which he goes to Detroit, Michigan, and here he goes to Wayne State and attains both a bachelor's and a master's degree in education. But when he's here, he really sees that, okay, um, the Armenians here, they don't really know how to speak Armenian. They don't know how to read Armenian. They don't know how to write Armenian. This is a problem. I have a solution to this problem. And for him, the solution was to create a daily Armenian school. And so in 1957, he moves to Los Angeles to do that. He gets his teaching credentials from CSULA and UCLA. And for three years, he's a teacher in the LA Public Unified, sorry, LA Unified School District. In Los Angeles, he, me he meets the love of his life, Rose and Jajikian, and they get married in 1961. So in 1961, him and his wife, they moved to Beirut, Lebanon to crowdfund for and raise awareness about this Armenian school that they're going to make in the United States. In the three and a half years that they're there, they have their three children, Avo, Ara, and Arpi, and they raise the needed funds and have pledges from other individuals. So they go back to the United States and in September of 1964, Ferayan is opened. So the first graduating class only had 12 individuals, but already we see in the second year there were 43 and this is increasing in number every year, right? Especially during the time where you have the Iranian revolution, you have the civil war in Lebanon and you have the Iran-Iraq war. And a lot of the people that are leaving these countries are Armenian. And a lot of the Armenians that are leaving are coming to Los Angeles. And naturally they wanna send their children to an Armenian school. And so the current or the at the time, the existing structure in Encino, California wasn't enough. And so eventually another location that will serve as an elementary school opens in North Hills. Now, my grandfather continues to serve in various roles in the community. And he eventually, along with other individuals, opens the Ararat, excuse me, the Ararat, a school, charter school in Van Nuys, which was established in 2010, and he continues to serve on the board until 2017. Now, when talking about his legacy, you know, 
he's done so much for the community. And one of the most important things that I can't stress enough is the ability for someone who was born in America and only, you know, would have known English and the American culture. And of course, that comes with multicultural things, right? But his legacy is really that Armenians born in the diaspora can actually read and write and speak Armenian. And I'm currently in Armenia right now, speaking with people reading and writing here because of him. And so many others like me that are born outside of Armenia and outside of major Armenian um, enclaves owe it to him because he's the reason that we speak and read and write Armenian. And he really influenced me to come here and taught me that even one person can make a difference. So if you have a goal or, and you think that it, you know, you, you can't, you know, what are you going to do about it? Well, no, like Gabriel and Jajikian's story is proof that your one dream, your one action can really make a difference. So I have a couple of pictures I would like to share right now. And of course, it's not working. All right. So this is my grandfather. And this is Kesab, Syria, right next to the Mediterranean. This is my grandfather as a child. This is the first structure in Encino. This is the current structure with its student population. All right. Thank you for your time, and I hope you have a great one. Thank you so much for that video. Well, um, next up will be Dr. Erica Bath speaking about Dr. Patricia Bath. Good afternoon, everyone, and special thank you to Los Angeles Public Library and the Octavia Lab. Uh, I'd like to just give a shout out to the Octavia Lab for really recognizing groundbreaking women and named after uh, Octavia Butler who broke ground in a male dominated genre. And that really resonates very specifically with the achievements of my mother, Dr. Patricia Bath, who broke several barriers, particularly in um, predominantly white spaces and male spaces. Um, one of her quotes that is uh, that I'd like to share that I think is very appropriate today is this notion of do not let your mind be imprisoned by majority thinking. And remember that the limits of science are not the limits of imagination. And so when we think about creativity, uh, sparking joy and interest and really seeing it to believing it and being a hidden figure, this sort of spirit really pushes you to believe you can do the impossible, which is really something that she instilled and valued in kids. Dr. Patricia Bath invented laser phaco, a new device and technique to remove cataracts. And it performed all steps of cataract remo removal, making the incision, destroying the lens and vacuuming out the fractured pieces. Dr. Bath is recognized as the first black woman physician to receive a medical patent. After completing an ophthalmology residency at New York University, Dr. Bath completed a corneal transplant surgery fellowship at Columbia University. While a fellow, she was recruited by UCLA Medical Center to co-found an ophthalmology residency at Martin Luther King Jr. Hospital. She then began her career at UCLA, becoming the first woman ophthalmologist on the faculty in its prestigious Jules Stein Institute. She then was appointed assistant chief of the King Drew UCLA ophthalmology residency program in 1974 and was the first female chief of an ophthalmology residency program in the country. She conceived of her laser phaco device in 1981 published her first paper in 1987, and had her first U.S. patent issued in 1988. Her minimally invasive device was used in Europe and Asia by 2000. Dr. Bath was always someone who thought about eliminating racial inequities and health inequities. 
when she was an intern in ophthalmology, she was one of the first to document that Blacks had double the rate of glaucoma as whites and realized that the high prevalence of blindness among Blacks was due to a lack of access to ophthalmic care. In a seminal paper in 1976, she proposed the discipline of community ophthalmology, combining public health, community medicine, clinical and day care programs to test vision and screen threatening eye conditions in historically underserved communities. That same year, she co-founded the American Institute for the Prevention of Blindness, designed to protect, preserve, and restore sight through education, community service, research, and eye care. She believed that eyesight was a basic human rights. She's been recognized as a laser pioneer and among her numerous honors has also been recognized by the National Science Foundation, the Lemelson Center, the American Medical Women's Association, the US National Library of Medicine, the American Academy of Ophthalmology Museum, uh, the Alpha Kappa Alpha Society, and most recently, was the, one of the first black women in its 50 year history to be inducted in the National Inventors Hall of Fame. My mother was very passionate about STEM education and moving it as upstream as possible. And so this honor in particular, I know would ring so true to her heart in terms of inspiring young people uh, to believe and to be committed to careers in science. Thank you. Yeah, when we discovered your mother's story, because we were looking for African-American inventors. We purposely went out and looked and your mother's story just brought the house down. It's just one of those really inspiring moments where, bravo, I mean, you're you're phenomenal also, <laughs> but your mother, both the two of you, thank you so much for taking, bringing up, taking the time out to be here today. Well, thank you for seeing us. We have to see and uplift and amplify each other. So I appreciate your work and your commitment to really removing, you know, showcasing people who are hidden in plain sight. So thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, so, so next up, we're going to be uh, speak, hearing from the family members of Hashem al Shile, And we're very, very excited to hear this story. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ryan. This is my little brother, Mahmoud. Um, we're the son and daughter of Hashem El Shalei. So um, a little background on my dad. He was actually born and raised in Palestine, um, migrated to the US in the mid 80s. Um, my dad's a very, very, very humble and selfless man. Um, and it reflects in all of his kids. Um, and honestly, it's an honor. Well, first and foremost, thank you guys for having us. And thank you to the Octavia Lab and the Los Angeles Public Library for allowing us to speak today. Um, my dad, um, he's Middle Eastern, comes from Palestine and Jordan. And he is seriously an amazing guy. He, um, it's very touching to talk about him because we just lost him earlier this year. And he... Did, we really didn't know the impact my dad had on the world and the, and his community because until he his passing and that just shows how humble he was. He um, since an early age, there's part of our culture when someone passes, there's a certain way you have to bury someone, and um, it's part of the Muslim religion. My dad, when my dad's dad passed, he was younger and there was no one to do it the culturally how it's supposed to be done. So my dad stepped up as a little kid and did it for his dad. And I think ever since then, it kind of like um, made him, mo motivated him to do it for people that either A, didn't have anyone that wanted to do it for them or just didn't know how to do it correctly. So ever since then, my dad always volunteered to take on that lead and always, you know, help families in need or help anyone that didn't have that, um, the proper way they were supposed to do it in our culture. So since then, my dad's primary job was truck driving for many, many years. And on the side, he would always uh, either a volunteer in doing the proper burial, burial for the Muslim religion, um, or he, and then he later on when he stopped truck driving, which was 10 years ago, he just fully 
started doing the um, the mortuary. He worked at a mortuary, well, volunteered at a mortuary and uh, started doing the burial. So a little bit of background again about my dad. Um, he came from nothing, came to the US, raised my five, me and my four other siblings and uh, just, he's an amazing man. So uh, he started working at the uh, Garden Grove Mortuary and how it first started is he became a volunteer there. He would, uh, like I said, um, do burials for families in need, families that didn't have loved ones. So my dad would properly bury them the way they're supposed to be buried. And I think his, you know, his impact just took a big impact or his, the person he is took a big impact on the community and his story started to um, progress within the community. Uh, he, three weeks after his passing, actually the Los Angeles Times reached out to my family and myself and actually told us how much he impacted the community and wanted to share his story in the Los Angeles Times. So he did make front page. Um, we have the newsletter here, we're very proud of it. And as you can see, I have it framed on my back wall. Um, yeah, so me? I'm his son, Mahmoud Chile, and uh, I'm actually the youngest of, it's a total of five of us. And um, I used to actually work with my father and uh, got to share some of the experiences of how he touched uh, many people of the Los Angeles community and Garden Grove. Um, we started volunteering at the Islamic Center of Orange County in Garden Grove. And um, we also volunteered with the uh, Olive Tree Mortuary as well. Um, he's been very uplifting. He's such a humble person and empathetic. He usually, you know, anytime somebody calls him, it can be in the middle of the night, hey, somebody passed away, we need some type of service. He never, my, my dad was the type, he never did it for money. He never did it for like fame or any of that. He just wanted to genuinely help people. And he wanted, uh, basically, he felt like it was his service that, you know, God sent him and put him on this earth to, to help others, you know. And, and, you know, God gave him the, the gift and talent to know how to do it properly. So he was able to share that with many people. And I've, I've gone to it's unfortunate the amount of people that I had to meet in those circumstances, but I am very humbled and blessed that I, I was allotted that opportunity. Um, my father, like I, I can say, just if I, if I can pull up a Webster's Dictionary and, and pull up humble, it'd be a picture of my father. That's what I see. And um, definitely he's a, he's a type, he wouldn't say no to anything. You know, if somebody needed help with, with any type of service uh, dealing with uh, death or burial, um, he was the one that guided them and helped them uh, throughout the entire process. So, you know, having him published on the Los Angeles Times and um, his partner, Goled, as well, Goled Farha, he's a very humble man as well. And uh, definitely it shows how much of an impact he made on the community. He's the type of person that never wanted any type of recognition anytime he was anywhere after he does his prayers and and uh helps uh helps the people along he kind of steps back and he's like okay like you know he never wanted to highlight and <laughs> he would actually be pretty upset with us like he does if not if he, he knew that he like, was in know, the los angeles <laughs> yeah. he, would, he does not like uh that type of recognition because i feel like maybe it um, tarnished his humbleness but in reality it's not we we all know that he was just a dedicated person and he needs to have his name out there. And uh, I would like to thank you guys for allowing us this opportunity. We, um, it really means a lot to myself and my family. And me and my brother are both police officers now. Um, and just being, you know, like us serving the community is a really a big reflection of my dad. And it's very motivating because he always served his community and always wanted to help everyone else he would give you the shirt off his back and i think that's what me and my little brother strive for today as well within our own communities and just you know carrying on his legacy um again you know since early age you know my little brother and i always question like why is dad not at our like so or like sporting events but 
to sit back and realize why now and how he missed a lot of activities for us just to help everybody else and put everybody else before himself really humbles me and just really allows me to, you know, remember him with and be so, so blessed that I had such an awesome dad and such a hero of the dad that, you know, he just made sure that everybody else was taken care of before himself. Um, but yeah, again, thank you guys for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. You know, my dad, we can go on and on and on about my dad because he was just such an inspirational person. Aya, do you uh, want to speak? Oh, hello. Um, so my father, like, like my siblings said, I'm actually one of the oldest. I'm a twin. Um, and uh, they're right. I'm sorry. Being, I'm so sorry. I'm being a nurse and losing him this year to COVID. Um, you know, because he's so selfless and pre prepping bodies during this time is, you know, very dangerous. But he didn't care. He still did it because he was so selfless. It's truly an inspiration. I'm normally good. I don't know why I'm so emotional today. But thank you guys once again. We truly, truly appreciate it. And um, he's, like I said, he would be uh, quite upset that we're honoring him today. But he deserves it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the hard tribute from the Shilas. I, we are very, very, we were very inspired by your father's story. And we have been, we spent this past year making face shields and being heartbroken about COVID-19. And for us, it's sort of like a twofold, like story of somebody seeing a problem and just going at it at such a young age and just learning so many traditions is sort of like, with you know, with with burial traditions, it's just sort of like what your father did is what you know was phenomenal. I I could not, we could not, we learned so much about the Muslim culture just by learning. And you know, you know, the little bit I could, you know, we could put in this coloring book was sort of just, just like a little little snapshot of it. And we're deeply sorry for your loss. Thank you. We appreciate it again. And thank you again for honoring my dad and allowing us to, um, or inviting us to be here with you guys today. Thank you. So next up um, will be uh, family members representing Ignacio Nacho Nava Jr. And um, we're looking forward to hearing what they have to say. Wow. Oh, yeah. This one. How y'all doing? Good afternoon. Hi. All right. So where did my notes go? Sorry about that. <laughs> so um, I'm Nacho's little sister, B. I'm his little brother, John. I'm his mom, Diana. And I'm his stepdad, Scott. Yeah, th we wanted to um, thank LA Public Library and the Hidden Heroes Project for including um, our brother in this incredible like tribute to um, the hidden heroes of Los Angeles. Um, thank you also to the speakers who went before us for sharing their story. Um, it's been, we consider it a privilege to be a part of this. <clears throat> so um, Ignacio Nacho Nava, um, known to us as Junior, um, created Mustache Mondays uh, in 2007 um, because there was no other space like it that existed at that time. Um, in LA, it was always um, just like a very predominantly um, 
white driven space for like pretty queers. Um, and he created a space for everyone else. Um, everyone like that were considered outcasts or um, the queerdos of the scene. Um, so he wanted uh, to make a safe space for them and for himself. Um, and his reach expanded from where he started in Los Angeles and went all the way down to Mexico City, New York, parts of London. Uh, people knew that name, Mustache, all over. Um, he helped provide a stage for underrepresented artists and creators um, that ended up going on to doing bigger um bigger things and had uh, bigger, more grand stages to to do what they did best. And <clears throat> I know he always considered it um, a great privilege to to be able to help give them a start where they weren't able to to break ground anywhere else. Um, he really did a lot in helping to shape what downtown Los Angeles is today and making it an attractive place to be. Cause back then it was still kind of scary and nobody wanted to be there. And he, he changed people's perception of what it could be. So um, that's kind of the highlight of his story but it definitely doesn't cover a fraction of what he did. Yeah, you know, for me, um, when my brother passed, I think, and I think it probably reigns true for a lot of the people, you know, speaking today, you know, the, the impact that they had uh, probably wasn't the family and some of the people that were so close to them, you know, because of how humble, at least I could say for Junior, how humble he was. Uh, he didn't talk about it a lot. Um, the side that my sister spoke on, you know, and his accomplishments within his uh, career there in, in doing his events uh, is really just one side. For me, I felt like the, the, the greatest honor uh, when he passed was seeing how much of a positive impact he had on his community, um, how selfless he was in helping other people um, and putting them first. You know, he never talked about that, but I think that was one of the biggest things that came out of his passing was how much of the impact, the things he did off the stage when, you know, it wasn't the nightlife, when he was just living his day to day and when he was helping others live their day to day. Uh, he uh, not only did he have a great impact for, you know, the LGB uh, community and, and, and whatnot, um, but really just his community as a whole. Um, he was somebody that liked to help his neighbors, uh, who was neighborly himself, um, who would uh, do things for, you know, the less fortunate that were in the community. Um, and he was always a big supporter of the community. Um, he was always, you know, anytime he was, I, we joke about it and we say that, you know, by far he was the coolest out of all of the siblings. Um, but no joke, absolutely was. Uh, I'd see him and I'd say, hey, man, where'd you get that cool shirt? He's like, oh, I bought it off, you know, down the street in some alley, right, at a, a little stand. And it, it just, you know, that's, that's he was very down to earth, very humble. Uh, and to see how big of an impact he had on his com community was very inspiring for me personally and uh, many other people that were a part of his passing um, and, and were able to witness his funeral, uh, which was incredible. You know, I mean, it makes me reevaluate life in general. Um, you know, somebody's uh, true value isn't what we do, uh, you know, just every day or, or the, the goals that we've accomplished, but really how positive of an impact have we had. And, uh, you know, the, the amount of people that poured out love when he was sick and when he was in the hospital for a month, you know, and the amount of people that poured out love in the days passing and you know at his funeral um you know there's been murals put up throughout the country at this point documentaries 
it's it's been an incredible um experience to not only live beside him and and know him in life but to get to know him even more in his passing you know i feel like like i know him more now than i ever did before just because he's continually being honored in different ways and being shown love still for what he did and it just goes to show like how deep his how deep his his presence like really did affect people and and how much they miss it so do you want to say anything <clears throat> you know being his mom and and going through this loss has been you know pretty tragic but it it's not just my loss you know he's got his brother and sister that are here today and he's got giovanni who is downstairs and too shy to get in front of the camera, but loved him dearly. And he has his brother, Robert and Angel that couldn't be here. Lots of family all over that are watching today that loved him so very much. He was a favorite nephew and a favorite cousin, and, you know, just a favorite to so many people on so many different levels. But like John and Vicki said, you know, um, he was so humble. We had no clue of the magnitude of his reach until he was in the hospital and all of his friends and his chosen family were there every day for a month solid with the vigil and bringing food and bringing prayers and just bringing all kinds of love. And I have four children, but I've gained hundreds of children through his passing that have come that share stories and share his love and just want us all to know that he will never be forgotten. You know, we're going on three years and it is still celebrated, this precious life of his, you know, and there's not a birthday that goes by, not a Dia de los Muertos, not an anniversary date of his passing that isn't honored by everybody who knows him. And like John said, you know, he, his reach was so far across all the planets and just worldwide and the people that came to his funeral that continue to love him and do everything to make sure that he will never be forgotten and we thank you from the bottom of our hearts for this honor and this pleasure to be a part of this and to know that you guys recognized him as a true true angel that he is and we all all have a garden angel dealt through him loving us and taking care of us and thank you everybody and especially his chosen family the kids that started mustache with him i know you guys are probably thinking you're not kids you know but that's how i think of you you know danny and josh and i know there's one other ashlyn and yeah there's and others. dino dino yes dino I, I haven't met him personally but i i know of him just all of his family anita everybody you know who you are that we love so much and we thank for taking care of him the way you did and for remembering him thank yeah, you he will be missed thank you so much thank you Thank um, you. Thank you so much for that tribute. I'm deeply honored that the family, we had two families show up. Thank you so much. Thank you again for including us. Yes, thank you. So next up on our list is going to be um, Marissa Aranda, who's going to be representing Julia Bugatti. Thank you. Hi everybody, um, my internet and my connection might be a little wonky, but um, my name is Marissa Ronda. I'm Julia Bagini's great granddaughter. And um, I wanna say first and foremost, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak up on her behalf and just be able to represent her and um, share such incredible things that she's accomplished. And um, yeah, so I'm actually currently at an event, um, a silk film workshop that she actually uh, and uh, it in me um, with our culture of how to continue her legacy. Uh, Julia Bogany, she was such such a 
a selfless person. She she went upon amongst herself to learn her own culture, her own background for the sake of my uh, people and future generations. Um, sorry. Uh, uh, everything she's done was for the, um, the goodness for not herself, but for the people who she was teaching. One of the things that she always, um, one of the things that she always taught me was to only teach those who want to be taught rather than um, forcing it onto other people because those who don't want to be taught, um, they just, they wouldn't get the point. But um, she, she's, she's been everywhere in LA. She, Julia has traveled miles and miles and miles and spent um, so much gas money. Uh, Julia, she lives, she lives in San Bernardino and um, she would go out to LA probably every other day doing workshops, um, working on projects with other people, or even just a simple meeting with somebody. It was always her, her, um, her goal to expand the culture and expand um, her knowledge onto other people. And although she wasn't taught by birth um, on what to do, she she took it amongst herself to do that, and that's something that I really um, am inspired by by her. And unfortunately, I don't have as many people with me just because her family is so minimal. But the support that she had with other people and the support group that other people were able to provide for her, it really touches me. And um, I just wanted to thank you for the opportunity to uh, give me, um, to, to let me say a few words about her. Uh, she's truly an inspiration and her legacy still lives on today. Uh, to today and hopefully for future generations because that's what we're working for. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marissa, on speaking on uh, Julia Bogani, talking about elder. Um, next up will be Andrea Borchardt, who's going to close out her show today. Hi, I wanted to thank everybody for coming today and I wanted to to let you know that for us in the Octavia Lab, it was, or let me say, for me in the Octavia Lab, it was really easy to feel lost the past couple of years because even though we had the opportunity to make face shields and it felt like we were doing good, it just, it felt like bad things kept happening. And then we started to learn about all the members of our community who did such great work and it was, it became a lifeline because once you can see how people work to make the world better, it gives you a way to move forward. Um, so I wanted to thank everybody because your family members really helped us and you showing up today really helped too. It was, I don't have the words for what a big deal it was and how much it meant to all of us. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, we have 10 minutes left. If there are any questions, put it in the comments, what we put in the chat, and we'll answer. We'll hopefully, if there are around, we'll hopefully answer them. But otherwise, thank you so much for being a great grand inventor of this coloring book. And we hope that these resources and these coloring pages and the profiles we have inspire you to do the best work and help out your community do the best that you can. I also just want to say how, you know, I think it's clear from this, all the stories we heard today, which were just so all, all of them so moving and so inspiring. I think there was a common thread of family members saying, we didn't even know, you know, our, 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 family member, our loved one was so humble, you know, and just that was just their life. And that's what they did. And they were so humble that we didn't even know the extent of everything they did until, you know, years later. And I think that that really shows, you know, that that the name, the Hidden Heroes Historic Places is, you know, it's true, you know, some of these heroes were 
you know, not celebrated um, within their lifetimes or, you know, even enough now. And fortunately, they're beginning to be. But I think that this book that the Octavia Lab you know, team has created is really such a key part of bringing those heroes out of hiding and sharing their incredible stories and bringing those inspirations and ideas to our generation and future generations. So I just want to applaud the Octavia Lab team for the incredible work that they've done. It is just, um, just spectacular. And, um, you know, on behalf of the lab and of best friends, we encourage um, everyone, of course, to order the book. Uh, the library store carries it. Um, there are several resources online as well um, and help share these stories. So thank you all so much for coming.